So I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey and I want you to use your imagination. I'm always told everything's in my head and I'm making things up and it's in my imagination. Well, I'm real today and I'm here. This is going to be my journey. And I don't normally use slides because usually when I send emails they go to the moon. I'm not particularly useful with things. But these slides hold quite a powerful meaning for me because I lost a friend who Julie knew called Wayne Savile last year. He took his own life. And he enabled me to travel because two years ago I couldn't travel on my own. So to be here with you today, Wayne has been by my side, even though he's not here. And now I've not gone off the planet, lovely. He's with me. And he helped me to go to Bessa Humber Bridge. And today I got here, and yesterday I got here, through all the snow in Wigan. I know you've got beautiful weather up here. But there's blizzard conditions. I came on my walker. Right, there it is, Winnie. Meet Winnie. It's over there, new type of handbag. So he helped me put these slides together. And because he was very good at slides, he was very good about a lot of things. But he lost his battle because he couldn't win past the stigma and the misconceptions of his mental illness. It was a battle he told me he would never be allowed to win. And he didn't. And he asked me and Julie and Nick Horn to carry on the work he started continue that work with you, alongside you, together, to make a difference for people. So is it that one I've asked me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, here it goes. Wish me luck, guys. <laughs> right, so I'm going to take you on a journey, and I want to give you a clear warning, and I do this wherever I go, whoever I speak with, I don't speak at or to people, I speak with people. I listen and I care. And my only way of taking care of you today if this gets too heavy or emotional, and it will do, this is real, this is real life experiences of mine, feel free to leave room. I hope you don't. There's a breakout room out there. Go and have some space. You are all human beings. You're possibly all staff, and we have some of our fellow colleagues, expert advice readers here today, and your carer lead here, um, who is vital to this process, because without my family, I wouldn't be here. They've been in, with me when I've been totally bonkers, and I can say that, and I know it's not politically correct, but then again, I'm not a politician, okay? And I laugh about me and some of the daft things I do and some of the serious things I do. They're not funny, but I can laugh about me because sometimes I have to, okay? So feel free to go and have some space and please, we're going to make sure that there's some people around that can come and speak with you, listen to you, because you're all human beings and you've all got your own lived experience. It could be, it might not be about abuse, it might be you've got into debt, you've lost a friend or a colleague or a member of your family, you're grieving, there's so many different things that can knock the bottom out of your world. You can go home this afternoon and I please God you don't and something could happen that will completely knock your socks off. And I don't care whether you're rich, poor, all of that. Mental illness does not discriminate. <coughs> you can be as clever as you like. Something could happen that could throw you into complete despair and depression, you people. So thank you to the board, thank you to Julie. Thank you for Kirsty for organising me to get here. <laughs> Otherwise, of course, have it on the train. Um, me and my friend do. Right. So here we go. I'm just going to take you through a few places where I've been contained in. But obviously I come from Liverpool, you can tell. I'm not a bit pop, but I don't do cellar either. Okay. <laughs> I can do or I'm not going to. This is a place called John Baggett's Hospital in Liverpool. It's a hateful, horrible place. And I went there when I was, well, I was taken there. <coughs> when the abusers hurt me so badly, I had to go there. It was um, an ear, nose and throat hospital back in the 60s, 50s, 60s, 70s. I know I look young, guys, it's a week. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was horrible there. 
Look at it. It's always about the place, but it was nice. This is Royal Liverpool Children's Community well, Hospital. It was one of my, it was one of ours. A long, long time ago, before it was Mercy Care. Before Mercy Care was even dreamed of. Look at it. What does that picture say to you? <coughs> I went there and I was this big. I was so scared. That's in Waterloo. A more exclusive part of Liverpool. Not, okay. <laughs> And it's called St John's School. I didn't go to school. My father wouldn't let me out of her sight. She knew if I went to school and someone asked me those questions, I might <coughs> I never did. That was a church school. That's the church. The school is just a bit round the corner. But I only went there when welfare officers were about to visit. It was clever, my mum. They were really clever. <clears throat> and there's Paddington. Okay, you might think why Paddington. Little brown suitcase. I like Paddington. I didn't have toys when I was a kid. I like Paddington. It's quite significant, that picture. So one of those days I was allowed. Notice the word allowed. We often use that word. You're, in, you're allowed to have peanut butter. <laughs> You're allowed to come out your room. You're allowed to go in your room and be locked in. Just think of that word. Hold on to these words I'm saying. One day I was at school. I didn't know why I got sent to school. I didn't have proper shoes on, they didn't fit. I had no underwear on because I was never allowed to wear underwear. I was dirty, had lice in my hair. Suddenly, this very stern looking lady came. I thought I'd been bad. And she said, We're just going on a little trip. This big. <coughs> How many of you in the room got children? Yeah. So imagine if a strange woman, <coughs> or a man, <coughs> Came and picked your child and said, We're just going on a little trip. And I have my voices telling me, You need to do as you're told. In that tone, do as you're told. I'm hearing that right now. They could just go away for that. Okay? So she took me on a bus, a ribble bus, a red bus, all the way to Skellon Street in Liverpool, next door to the Adelphi Hotel to a little cafe which was a WRBS canteen where all the WRBS ladies and in the back I was taken by this lady holding tight on to my hand I never uttered a single word I was too frightened here I am getting taken away my mum's told me never to tell anyone where's my mum? I need my mum because I, know, I need to know what to do okay they gave me a little brown suitcase <clears throat> and in the little brown suitcase was a pair of clean knickers, a little dress, some shoes and a coat. So when I went, I didn't know where I was going at this point. Going in my suitcase, just like Paddington. And I ended <clears throat> up here in a castle. <clears throat> and I used to say to her, I've gone, I've been living in a castle. Don't be stupid. Who put you in a castle? a bad girl. And there I was in the castle, Broughton Towers Special School in Barrow and Furness from Liverpool on the train with a strange lady holding my hand tight all the way. She didn't speak to me, didn't tell me where I was going. My head did, being bad. You're getting pulled away. That's what my mother was. If you ever open your mouth, you'll get pulled away. You won't have a mum. I won't be there to save you, because you're a bad, dirty, wicked little girl, and you tell lies. My mum visited me once in that whole time. When I was there for 11 months. I was mute when I got there. Hard to believe now, isn't it? But there you go. And that was a room where we used to sit on a big windowsill. And I used to watch for her coming. She came once. And during the time when I was abused, which I'll get on to in a sec, she had something called my reminding time. 
And those reminding tampons remind me to keep my mouth shut. Because if I didn't, I would be dead. And she meant every single word, and I was terrified. I didn't speak when I was there. So I was there for quite a while, and then I looked it up when I was, and you and all that false memory syndrome nonsense was going on. I mean, it could be true, I suppose. But I wasn't out of the I did believe I was making it up, because that's what you're told. And that was Broughton Tower. So can you imagine me going to that school, walking through those doors, yeah, standing in the foyer, big matter. I was only little, so it was huge. And I didn't know where I was going. I wet myself in that foyer, I was terrified. But I knew as long as I was good and I did as I was told, I'd be okay. We had a place in there when we were bad, or deemed to be bad, or our behaviour was deemed to be bad, because I didn't speak, I was bad. So I got put in a room called the dungeon. You're talking about in the late 60s? They call it now, well, it's not school now, it's actually a hotel. When that guy was there, that room was called a quiet room. Does a quiet room ring any bells to anyone in the room? Quiet room. You go into the quiet room. Would you like to go to the quiet room? No. Well, you're going. It's called a quiet room in there. It was called the dungeon when I was there. But the children that spoke about what was going on in there, remember it. They got told if they were bad, they were going to the dungeon. Now, okay. So, <coughs> this is where it gets a bit hard for you and for me. So I was a, a four-year-old child, and I was abused by my mum and in many men and women friends from the age of four till I was well into my teens. I knew no better. I wasn't let out. I didn't see other children. I wasn't allowed to have any friends. And the only people that did come were abused like me. So I want you to picture the scene. You get a phone call. And you get told, you get, you've got a range of diagnosis. Do you want to know what I've got? Shall I enlighten you? Okay. So, I started off with postnatal depression, then I got severe depression in many forms. That could be reactive and all the other things. All, all of you educated nurses they all know what to do. Well, I had them all. I'm greedy. Bipolar disorder, which used to be called manic depression. Great that. Think of those words. It will become clear. Manic. Does that suggest to people, okay, I'm going to start asking, what does manic look like? You get told, someone's coming in, 62, she's blinking manic. That's how I was used to be described. I hear lots of surgeons being described like that. Yeah. Yeah. I've got personality disorder, emotionally unstable personality disorder if you wish. Emotional's okay. How many people get emotional in this room? Yeah. How many people cry? Laugh? Giggle? Go bonkers now and again when you've had too much to drink? <laughs> Yay! You're all human, aren't you really? So, but emotionally unstable personality disorder. <coughs> When the psychiatrist diagnosed me with personality disorder, I said, there's nothing wrong with my personality, it's yours. I got kept in. <laughs> I got kept in quite a lot. Ah, oh, it was bad. Paranoia. Severe psychotic episodes. Severe self-harming behaviour. I had that. This emotionally unstable personality disorder. What are the symptoms of that? What do you get told? So I'll, get, I'll, you know, I'll give you a heads up because I'm being educated today. Right. So I'm narcissistic, attention seeking, manipulative. All of them things. I, I mean, I, I probably could be. How many people in this room do you think could have traits of narcissism? <laughs> Come on, be honest. Everyone has. Yeah. We all like to be me, 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 me. But I've got it worse than anyone else. So there you go. Okay. <laughs> I severely self-harm. The staff have to keep me safe. 
I've nearly lost my arms and my legs to severe self-harm. I can't remember when I self-harm. I can't feel pain. I now have a diagnosis that probably fits the bill more. And you may have heard about it. It's re really recognised now. It's in the DSM-5. I don't suggest you read it. You'll be depressed. Yeah. I'm sorry if there's any psychiatrists in the room. There are. Oh, good. Well, I'm glad. And I really like you, honest. I've been to a few. And I was asked at a conference once when I said that, you know. I said, I've been to a few psychiatrists. And she said, oh, I haven't killed any of you either. It's not yet. It's not yet. No, I haven't because, and I have been, I've had a lot of psychiatrists, but I got one who's phenomenal. Why is it phenomenal? Because he took the time to care, and he took the time to find out about me as a person. But then he went and diagnosed me with did. Who knows what did is? Dissociated identity disorder, that's a good one, isn't it? Couldn't even spell that. And do you know what he did? The only thing he ever did wrong was he sent it to me in a letter. We've got a new one to add to your list to put on your t-shirt. Because yeah, they are going to t-shirt. And it, there's this did thing. It wasn't funny. I thought, oh wait. So if I haven't got enough, you give me another one. But it was probably the best thing that ever happened to me because it made me Go and find out. I went and did the thing the doctors tell you. How many people have been to the physical doctor and they give you the diagnosis? Yeah. Don't Google it, they say. <laughs> <laughs> what did I do when Googled it? <laughs> it wasn't a lot of information, it has to be said, about well, did at the time. Because it was only sort of being thought of. People didn't believe it. It was called dissociated identity. So that makes real sense to me. Because I have got multi personalities. And if you think about the trauma I've suffered, your brain has the capacity, especially when you're little, to shut pain off. So there's a lot of me, and now I've learned to live with them and support them, because they're not going to go away, the part of me, but because of the severe trauma, we can't join them all up. So my brain has to constantly support them. So things like smells, sounds, my voices constantly tell me all the time I'm bad, I'm evil, I'm wicked, you're stupid, you're thick, you've got no... But all of those horrible things and much worse. If I think I've upset someone, then suddenly my parts will tell me I'm going to die. And I believe them. And just for your information, I'm to spook it even more now. My mum follows me around wherever I go. She's over there behind you. Don't have to look to my mind, but she's real to me. And I found out suddenly, and I realised suddenly why she, I see her every day. <coughs> and hopefully one day I'll feel safe enough not to see her. But why I can see her, as clear as I can see any of you in this room, I know she's not hurting any other children. So for me, I don't know where she is. She cooks the hell out of staff when they get in their car. And I tell her she's behind them. You know. And I laugh about it because I have to. She's a scary woman. She's horrible. And someone said to me a long time ago, just I love you, Mum. What do you think the answer was? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I do. Because when you're little, and even when you're growing up, your parents are the only people you have. She was my mum, and as long as I did exactly as I was told, and she controlled me to the extreme, I knew what to do, when to do it, who to speak to, who I couldn't speak to, what to say, when to say it, when to go to bed, when to wee, when not to wee. That always let me down, my body always let me down. You know, when you, when you need a wee, you need a wee, it's as simple as that. So that's me when I turn up on your wall. No, it's not. This is me. And I'm scary. Because you're seeing 62 year old, mum of four, now, five grandchildren, two wonderful dogs, a naughty parrot, two rabbits. That's me. But when I'm not well, I'm not in your today world anymore. I'm back 
in sort of situations I've just described. So I want you to, I'm just going to let your imagination, I want you to imagine a little child, boy, girl, this high. And I want to share with you just a little of what being restrained feels like and why I work hard, Julie, and all the other people I support and with, the carers, our carers are so vital to this process. I can't tell you how important they are and how wonderful you are to have someone employed in your service. I'm this figure in my head. Now you've already been given a report about me. <coughs> They're already stopped short. Stop the journey. I'm violent. I'm going to hurt you. And possibly I will. You'll understand why I'm in a minute. So I'm um, this big in my head. I'm a little child. And I want to go home. That's all you'll hear from me. I want to go home. I want to go home. Let me go home. Please let me go home. I want to go home. I want to go home. And that's all you'll get. I won't say anything else. And if you don't let me go home, I'll get out anyway. And the psychiatrist can go and do one, stick an injection in me, but we don't care if I'm going home. And I'm right <coughs> in your face. And you know I've got the most awful injury on my arm, my breast, my leg, it doesn't matter where. There will be one that I can't feel, I can't see, it needs attention. You've got to do that. We, have, we put our staff in a terrible position, you've got to care. And then I'm kicking the door. We put a lot of other people on the ward. They're seeing all of this. You've only got one option here with me. I will get out that door. I'll wait and I'll wait and I'll wait and I'll get out that ward. I don't want to be there. I want to be with you <clears throat> Some nurses say to me, Oh, why well, stop being stupid? Your mum's dead. No, she's not. She's in my head. It's scary. I need to go home to know what to do. So I'll get off your ward. This is real. This is real life. Picture the scene. The alarms are going. That's scary. That's noisy. I know from being experienced of being on ward so often, the next few minutes are critical. If I don't get off, I'm going to be on that floor. And they'll put me on the floor. They'll fight with me and I'll fight with them. I'm this big in my head. Imagine a, a little girl or a little boy that's frightened. What are they going to do? What are they going to do to you? You frighten them? They're going to kick. Bite, scratch, punch, spit in your face, and I do all that and all. And I feel ashamed to say that, but I'm not well. I'm poorly. I'm, I've been so traumatised. I'm back in that world. So you've got one on each arm and one on each leg. <clears throat> Doesn't matter whether you put me on my back or my front. I've been moved both ways by both men and women. Matters not to me. I'll do something to help. I'm on the floor. I can't hear anything by this stage. I can see your mouth move, moving. I can smell you. I'll know what weight you are as well if you're on top of me. But I'll fight you. But in that moment, I'll do exactly as I'm told. Because I know it'll be over soon. It'll be finished. And then I can get up and go in. You let one inch of me and I'll fight you. I will fight you. And I'll hurt you. And I'm big now. I'm not little. In my head I am, but I'm... But if when I come on your ward you see that distress, it will be obvious. If you're a human being and you care about other people, I'm standing there shaking. I might be swearing at you. You know I'm unwell. I'm coming on your unit. I'm poorly. It's a hospital. I'm coming to be careful. I'm not coming to be my handled on that floor. Well, you've got to keep me safe. So we're asking a lot. I'm asking a lot of you to try and even think about trying to minimise, stop restraint, physical restraint. We may never get there, but we have to be realistic. At that time, I need restraining from me because I am going to do the most awful damage. <coughs> so. If you knew a little bit about me, you may have a head start. You probably won't, but if you've nursed me before, you've got a lot of people on those wards with <coughs> skills. You've got lots of people on our wards with skills. Think about your age, physical workforce. Think about your domestics. They're all part of your team. So I do some looking up. Oh, damn it, it's called maybe I want to go and sleep. How long is it to sleep? But they will give me one line. Just one line. And tell me to write a poem. 
there's a bit of an added problem. I've got to find a green, pink, a red, a blue, a purple pen. I'm going to try doing that three o'clock in the morning. When your husband's locked it in so you can't get out, just in case you dissociate and end up in Timbuktu. This is one of my poems. Love come clear. Safe inside my corner, drawn onto the floor. Puddled in a corner and curled up in a ball. Trying to be invisible, not wanting to be heard. Tiny little girl, don't cry anymore. You're safe inside your circle, drawn onto the floor. So quite often, even though I've had a stroke, and I'm crippled with arthritis and gout, and now I don't go on the ale, as they say in Scousland. My family gave me hereditary gout. I didn't even know that existed. So not only did they do all this to me, they gave me bleeding gout as well. That's not fair. Anyway, so when they finish with me on that bed, and I'm little, and they've gone on to the next child, the next adult, I'll get off that bed and go in the corner. And I'll sit in that corner, and I draw an imaginary circle around me. I'm only little. And I think if that circle's there, they can't get to me. <clears throat> they can, and they did. But while I'm on your ward, leave me alone in that circle. I know you're worried about me. I know you know I'm, you're, I'm going to be crawling on my hands and knees to try and get up off the floor. I was on a camp service the day, and I got on the floor with a child, and I was sitting there, and I'm thinking, I'm going to get, I'm going to get up off the floor. I looked dignified. I didn't look dignified, and they all ended up laughing with me, so that was okay. But then, at times before people understood me and knew me, <coughs> that's what we often say on walls. You'll do as you're told. Don't do that. I know you. I probably in this room you probably don't, but there will be some staff that will, and they'll drag me out of my circle, leave me where I am. I'm okay. It might take a while, but I'm not going anywhere. I'm not kicking the door. I'm not spitting in your face. I'm not fighting you. I'm okay. I'm safe there. So, when I did go to school, that's what they did. You're thick. You'll never learn. You'll never do anything good. Your voices will say, I'll show you that, you know. We must have told me that every day. You'll never amount to anything. You're dirty. All you're useful for is what I train you to do. Okay, words. She was wrong. <coughs> she was so badly wrong. Because look at me now. So you know you're over there in that corner. I hope you're blink and learning, girl. Because I tell you, there you go. And I know that sounds spooky. I do talk to her all the time. I talk to me enough, I tell you. So, think about those words I said before. And we'll talk about that in a sec. So Wayne did all this technological stuff because I did it. Your words and your attitudes and your actions impact my life <coughs> more than my disability. I've got physical health issues and I've got mental health issues. I come as a package. My head can get as sick as my body and my body gets as sick as my head. I'm a big deal when I come on your world, guys. God, you've got some work to do. But you know what? You've got me here. People like you made a difference to me. Saved my life and you do that every day. I chose not to place this <coughs> in my ability. These are all quotes you can, you know, you can get them. My disability has opened my eyes to see my true ability. So all those <coughs> lies I was told. Because of you. Staff saw something in me all these years ago that I couldn't have seen in myself. They saw something in me. My social worker saw something in me and got me some support. If you can do just one thing well, you're needed by somebody. Be careful with your words once they are said. They can only be forgiven, not forgotten. Don't mix bad words with your bad mood. You'll have many opportunities to change your mood, but you will never get the opportunity to replace your words once they're said. Oh, God, I hate that photo. I'll tell you a bit of a story about that. We've got a great communications team. But we've got one fellow that thinks he's like Steven Spielberg. He knows I say this, it's okay. It's not in the proof, he's honest. And that was the first time I was being filmed. I look a bit different there. I was about 23 stone there. Different wig. And that's true what that saying says, and that's my quote. Perceptions of mental health have changed in my lifetime, but there's still a long way to go. We're all on a journey. 
We're all on that bus together. I'll never get told off when I say this. We're all on a bus. If you want to get on that bus with us, get on it. Come with us. We'll take you with us. We'll support you. We'll offer every bit of support you can have. Knowledge, guidance. We'll support you when you're finding this difficult. Mm. You don't want to come on this journey. It's not easy. Get off the bus. Really get off the bus because we can't take you with us unless you want to do this work. It's not easy. So the story behind that, the brand new building, state of the art building, fabulous. All these lovely raised flower beds, lovely lavender plants in, and I'm sitting next to them, terrified of what's. And lavender love the What's good lavender, don't they? It's supposed to be nice and calm. And not for me it isn't when there's a wasp flying around. And what you can't see is on the other ear there's a wasp doing it. And I got told to look pensive. That's pensive. I didn't even know what it meant. I couldn't spell it. But there you go. That's pensive. But Wayne, my lovely friend and colleague, he liked that picture and he always did it to wire me up. So thanks for that, mate. But see what can happen. Right? when we get this right. I did not get that on my own, that co-produced MD. I would never, ever in a million years ever believe that someone like me from Liverpool was bonkers, nutty as a fruitcake, sorry, I know it's not politically correct. I'm mad, but it'll make a difference and I hope we make a difference together. We can only do this work together. And I was naughty in there. I tried not to be, but my parts weren't going to have fun. So see this guy here, who oh, we were staying in, he's an Irish guard and he coached us for about an hour before we went in and we were told what we could do, a bit like being on a ward, what you can do, what you can do, what you wear, you know, cut off your bush in there, you don't even get so much as a butty in there or a drink, there you go. And we were told that if Her Majesty was in residence, she likes it hot. Charles is in there, he likes it cold. Oh boy, you went wrong, it was freezing. Freezing, hold on, we different. I was on two sticks at the time because I'd had spinal surgery. And we were told, so you're remembering all this, remember I've got voices? So they go, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah, this. and then you get told. You go when you're told. So, oh my God, sounds a bit too familiar. This. And he says, if you go too soon, I will drag you back. <laughs> If you don't go soon enough, I'll push you. I said, please don't do that, that's rude, and I'll end up on my floor, and that's not useful. So, and then there's all kinds of things going through my head about how to get the metal on, and going to pull the cardio off, and all this. No, just put a little ball in. And um, I did my curtsy, and I didn't fall over, and I remember just get three steps in, the curtsy, you call him your, your Royal Highness, and then after that you call him saying, I'm trying to remember this, and my voices are going, hey, it's happening, give me your loads and that. Have you seen the kip of him with one of them sayings? Really naughty. And I'd practised, because we were told, once he lets go of your hand, get off. <laughs> so I wanted to tell him exactly how you'd all supported me, with all your staff, people in the NHS, all our wonderful staff making a difference. I'd got me there, because I didn't do that on my own. Without you, I wouldn't have got there in a million years. So I practiced. And guess what? I got it all in, but guess what? I didn't let go of his hand. But then I've got this horrible thing when someone speaks to me in an accent, I do the back. <laughs> and he's a big posh, isn't he, you know? And he said, um, and you have mental illness? I'm like, I do. <laughs> <laughs> There's my family behind me, and I think, I'm trying to, I'm thinking, oh, God, stop it, stop it. So he said, and you work? I said, I do. <laughs> he said, where do you work? And then I got it all in, Medicare, NHS, blah, 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 blah. Did all that. And he said, really? And what have you got? I thought, oh, I was always told never to waste a crisis. <laughs> <laughs> so I give him the loss. But the first one I gave him, was emotionally unstable personality disorder. But I'm a person in me. I'm Iris. I was trying to tell it. It's not my fault. So just to finish in a sec, so I was I can't tell you or put into words how proud I am to get that. Because I can now represent you, other people in our care, our trust boards because 
they need support as well. So we need top down, bottom up, everyone involved. Our domestics are the eyes and the ears of our wards. When I'm not well, I've got horrendous OCD. One of my mum's tricks was to make me wash the sink. We had no hot water, so she'd smear it with lard and tell me to clean it off with no soap. I tried that once when I was unwell to try and see if I could achieve that. I couldn't. And if that wasn't bad enough, she used to measure if if it got most of it off, which sometimes I did, because I'd be stuck on seven, six, six, seven hours stood there with just a vest on cleaning. And then I think I'd got it right, and then she'd pull the tape measure out of her pocket and measure the dish strainer. And that's all. I was never meant to get those things right. I understand that now. So yeah. We've been on a bit of a journey this morning, but I want to, I want to show you not just that because although I'm proud of that, yeah, and I am proud of that. We thank you for helping. We need more people getting that. We need more people in our care. We need, we need more staff. So this year they haven't got it so bad. We've got some nurses who've got MBEs, and they say your name back, back to front when you're told to go. So I, I got Iris, Mrs. Benson. I thought, who the hell's that? It's me. <laughs> And Van Morrison got his on the same day. Oh, gosh, he's posh. He wasn't allowed to come near us. I'll tell you what, if he'd have found out I had mental illness, I would have been shipped out dead quick. Well, you know what? They called him Morrison Van. Who was that? I said, that's not English, is it? And he said to me, well, you're not English, you're from Liverpool. I said, what's that about? That's discrimination I'm going to have you on that. Anyway. So. Just to give you just a little bit of an indication of the sorts of things we can do when we get the chance to be able to do anything. So I'll work as an expert. Oh, we get called some funny things, don't we? An expert by experience. I'm an expert in my own life, nothing else. I'm a person in me. We need more of people like my course. We need more of you, because you've got lived experience. Working together, truly. Co-production is a bit of a thing with me, so don't go on about co-production, because to do co-production, we cannot go from 0 to 100 and not put any building blocks and stepping stones in place. There's a lot to do to support you to work with people like me and me to work with people like you. And if you get the time to do it right, it works beautifully. This is what you get. Yeah? So I'll do that work. I work for the Restraint Reduction Network, so I'm going to the House of Lords. That's if you let me. Um, to see the standards for our um, instructors that have to, will have to now have standards to work and, and to restrain. So they can't be doing the wrong things. They've got to have the right values as well. So why are we restraining someone? What can we learn when we do restrain someone? What can we learn? For that? How can we support the carers to understand if we've been restrained and hurt? I often hear, oh, it's confidential, we can't say that. Well, you know what? I'm a mum, and if I want to know my child is, say, warm and say, maybe need something, don't call the confidentiality on me. I'm a mum, I'm going to go home and worry if my child's warm. Or is he sick? <coughs> you can tell them that. You're not going to lose your job if you say someone needs a pair of knickers or a coat, for goodness sake. There are ways around that. We know they're all the boundaries, we know all the safeguarding, we know all that. But if you're caring for someone and they need some, an item of clothing or something to keep them clean up, you know what a bar of chocolate is? <coughs> that's not about confidentiality, that's about care. So I'm a public speaker. I've got a new title since last, last year. When I'm the vicar of Dibley now. <laughs> Probably because I look like her. And because I went to Liverpool Anglican Cathedral, I was asked two days before, no pressure on like I was just going to <coughs> Guess what, I was in the pulpit. I really got a buzz off that, but I've had a stroke, so I've got a gammy leg, so I have to take my shoes off at the bottom of the pulpit, and then when I got up there, they put a little box so I could see. That wasn't useful, there was a thousand people in that cathedral. So I went into induction mode and thought about how I, how I share some stuff with staff and I do training. <laughs> And it worked. And I said thank you. Which is all I wanted to do. I, I do, I teach the Safe Words Masterclass with Jeff Brennan. And now I'm involved with a chameleon, which is very similar to Safe Words. That's a lovely way of giving people and helping people 
find their gift. So I believe everyone's got a gift. We just need to help them share it. So I think that's enough for me. But this is a poem again in the middle of the blinking lights. The green and orange poem. And it was lovely because that's a conference I went to. A lady came up and gave me a set of pans. All different colours. So I've always got different coloured pens. So I don't have to try and break every obstacle we've got. Get one. And it's about you. It's about the future because together we are the future. We are a future of trying to do different things, caring in a different way. And you have a difficult job. But we need to give you the tool book, tools in your toolbox to help you support someone like me and the many of us in our care. And it's called In the Blink of an Eye. In the blink of an eye or a sigh or a breath, you can change from the past to a smile for today. In the blink of an eye, the words that we speak will be soft. Keep us safe. Safe from the past that's caused so much hurt. In the blink of an eye or a sigh. You are the future. The change from the past to today to be different. No control. No restraint. In the blink of an eye or a sigh. No more pain. Just be kind. Take the time. Make it different from the past. Make that change last in the blink of an eye. And I couldn't do that without you. I couldn't even read night when I first went into nursing care. Support Signet now, support Build. I've come a long way. Been on a journey. I'm still on that journey. I've got a few mountains to climb, yeah, we've got to get over the other side. We'll probably get thrown over the other side again to come back up. <coughs> but believe me, the stroke didn't stop me. I didn't speak for a while. God, people were so relieved. <laughs> oh. <laughs> But my determination, I came back because the care for, for my physical illness was so different. I'd had four TIAs and no one had noticed. I kept telling them I was falling over. I kept telling them my balance was good, my memory was going. And you know what they said to me? It's all in your head, I was. I was a massive strength. I had another one about 10 weeks ago. I was still here. So for those people, if they're watching on this film, you want me to go away? I'm not going to, because you guys need support to do this differently. And I'm going to be there every step of the way until we get it. We get it as best as we can, whilst being realistic and keeping people safe. Restraint doesn't necessarily keep you safe. The, the evidence is now showing that we can reduce staff sickness, because they don't get hurt. So we have lots of consistency in care. There's, there's evidence out there. Because when I first started this work, we had no evidence. So we were on a wing and a prayer, really, until we had the evidence. <coughs> Build up the evidence. <coughs> showcase what you're doing. Put yourselves on the map. We need you. I want that poster that was out on the wall. I was there, you know. I wasn't. I was a bit done with that. You know where they point at you? <laughs> I need someone to design you on an up-to-date one saying, we need you because we do. And we're going to work together, Julie and I, and everyone else in this room to make a difference for people. Because you're all a bit mad, you know. Sorry, I'm not a diagnosed yet. I get diagnosed. You might have a bit of it as well. <coughs> Thank you for listening. Ask me questions. I'm quite able to answer them. And if I can't answer them, I'll be honest with you and say, go and get support if this has affected you. And it will have done. But you're making a difference to so many people. And you save their lives. Never forget that. So we're going to work a bit together. And they'll probably go on a bit longer than we should always do. Um, but please, ask questions. If you're struggling, come and ask us. We'll support you to do things differently. But you need help too. So take care. But ask questions, because if you don't, you'll be here all day, because I'll start asking you. Well, should, we, <laughs> should we do questions? Is that all right? With uh, Coffee is at half ten, but let's just take kind of five minutes for questions. Have people got any questions they want to ask? They usually Iris? don't at this point, because you're usually short time. It's just an observation that um, you, when you mentioned that when you were getting restrained and you felt you were a little girl, did you find that if the staff were aware of that, so had prior understanding and information about you and your uh, your past and, and your how you behave when you're unwell, that restraint was dramatically reduced? But when staff were unaware of that, they're left with just the generic: how do we deal with? Uh, how do you deal with, with the, the, yeah. the initial? So, yeah. yeah. I can only answer that in, in this way, and that's to say, I know now when, so for instance, a, sta a staff member who had restrained me, 
and I was doing a No Force First engagement session, which starts people off thinking differently. Yeah, given the staff the awareness of shared this, I remember staff in there, and I knew she was struggling because I'd remember that, and I felt sorry. And she came up to me at the end in tears, and she said, "Iris, I'm so sorry I didn't help." How can you support me if you don't know? And I didn't bear it <coughs> because I hate her. So we said, I said sorry as well. <coughs> and that matters. We need to look at each other and, 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 and... No, I'm not a saint because, believe me, if I see things going wrong, I will do something about it, but I'll do it in the appropriate way. But if staff, I've since found out, because that question was in my head, so I went and asked, and on the feedback forums I asked, would this have made a difference if you'd have known a bit more about me? And it was a resounding 90%, 99% really. But just to, uh, we have an absolute responsibility to, to understand the context of that person and their personal journey. It's not that, that, in a sense, if we're lucky enough that somebody tells us, we have a responsibility to find out. And I'm sure at points when you've been admitted to us, actually you're not going to stand in the way that you just have and share with us in that lovely packaged way what's happened to you. Yeah. But actually your, your family will be able to share some of that. Yeah. And in things like your advanced directive and your ongoing care, that that information is all there. I've got an advanced, I've got an advanced statement, which I'm willing to share. It's anonymized, I use it in training now. It needs updating and I update regularly. But staff didn't know how to find that, because guess where it was, guys? It was in the communication file, it wasn't in the care plan. So from that, people, then we changed the system to make sure staff knew where to find that. But I've got to rely on staff actually going and looking for that. And if they haven't got time or they feel pressured, then they may not go and find out. And I've had staff say, well, we never get, we never get told when someone like you is coming in. Oh, there's me acting again, my mother always said I was an actress, but there you go. Um, and my answer to that is, look, it's visible. You've all got the skills to look, you've got eyes. If there's a 62-year-old woman standing in front of you, wetting herself, shaking, saying I want to go home, it's evident. You don't need a degree to know that there's something very, un something wrong with that. I'm distressed. Then you push me and say the wrong things, come at me, which is often the case, the looming over me, the tone goes, now you've been here before, now you know you'd have, and you know what you've got to do to get home. Well, I don't know, who are, these, I don't know who are these nurses. No, but they, they're, they're there. Hope they're, they're, they're not still employed. Oh, yes, they blink in okay. Yeah. Well, in Mersey Care. Well, they're all over the I think we need to be careful, because yeah. I think we've got these kind of... Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not culture, disputing it. I'm saying this is, this is I'm important. I'm giving you a real idea. mental health. It's yeah. not unique to Mersey no. Power or AWP. No. Mm. It's about culture and mental health that's taken years to create. We, we've, we've got to be realistic. We created this monster of restraint. We got prison officers authority in the 60s and 70s to come in and train our nurses how to restrain. Now you could argue we need to keep people safe. I agree. We need to keep it. It's vital to keep you and to keep me safe. But I get hurt just as much as you do if it's done wrong. And there was a culture in any area of healthcare. There still is a culture. You've only got to put the news on every blinking day. You put the news on yesterday or the day before. Medway Young Offenders Unit. That's in the news again because it's been being investigated. It takes two years to two to three years to investigate. Work. And there was a young man on there, and he'd been a naughty lad. Yeah, who disputing? He was there. And I watched this guy, this G4S security man, who were put in charge of people's care. Those young men still need care. There is always a reason why someone behaves to do, like they do. Behaviour is a form of communication. If someone's <coughs> behaving in that way, we need to listen. We need to take a step back. We don't always get time for that. I agree. Can I use, can I use you as a... So, on the TV, you see, there's a young lad and he's stood backwards against the wall. But he's got to go in his room to bed. It's eight o'clock. Bedtime. Old culture was next staff. Yeah. 
at times, not all of them, some of them. And the G4S God has got his hands like that. And you can see it. I can see it. If you look clear enough, go back and look. It's on, it's on YouTube. Pressing his arm. <coughs> if you look at the lad, now I can lip read quite well. And he was saying, please don't hurt me again tonight. I said that to my mum every single night. So there again, you're recreating a trauma that doesn't need to be. That young man has obviously been hurt at some point. And he's going in that room. And who knows, he might be hearing the same things as me. So I agree that there are times when we need to keep people safe, but we also need to learn from those incidents of restraint. I mean, people, Beth Morrison, I've just done a film with Beth Morrison and a member of staff from St Andrews, which is given out on the Restraint Reduction Network conference, possibly on the 5th. And we come at it from three different experiences. So a staff member whose auntie was killed under restraint. You've got me, who was restrained as a child in that children's home, locked in cupboards and all that. And Beth Morrison, whose son has autism, who was badly, badly hurt. Nearly died on the floor. You've got to ask yourself, do we put people in hospital to be cared for? Or do we... They're not, you're not in a prison here. Our hospital's not a prison. And this isn't... Mercy Care have come a long way. We have centre for perfect care. It doesn't mean to say we're perfect. What it means to say is we're working together to strive to be. And as long as we learn, and we listen, and we care, and we... T I need to get boards and all, all of the people that, and the systems to give you time to do all of this work. Because one of the things I hear wherever I go, we haven't got time. We're short of just that. There's this, there's this, there's this, there's this. There's so many things that can scupper this work. But we may, need to work with you and get you to have the time to explore, to do the training, all of that. This doesn't come by just one. I'm only a tiny, tiny cog in that wheel. But together, we're the whole wheel. Yeah? It's a nice analogy. That's it's nice. Thank you very much for sharing. We're going to stop for coffee now. Um, coffee is just <coughs> down on the right hand side. If you can kind of grab a coffee and then come back, that would be great, and then we can catch up <coughs> a little bit of time. That'd be brilliant. And I'm, I'm here till Thursday, where I have a little time change. <coughs> Send you home. <laughs> um, please come and, uh, and chat if you've got any burning questions. Or if you don't want to come and ask those questions, write them down. Yeah. But, you know, let's explore. You don't have to put your name on them. If you're finding it difficult, we can support you, but we need to know. If we don't need to know what you're struggling with, we can't help. Okay. <coughs>